say what you... Not the same thing a bit. Why, you might as well... Is the same thing as I... What I see. This building will have lunch rooms and snack bars urging us to eat together and hi-fi and TV news. The new student... It sounds easy. Just say what you mean. Yet I first began to realize how much this phrase implies while we were studying language in Professor Morgan's speech class. We started off with a question, what is the function of language in the process of communication by speech? These lines represent the impressions which a speaker receives from the world around him. Books he reads, people he talks to, things he sees and hears and experiences. He's been accumulating these impressions since he was born. They go through his brain and become associated with each other. Then out of these impressions, the speaker's brain forms an idea or concept. And then the speaker chooses symbols, words and phrases to represent his idea. And he uses these symbols to convey his idea along the sound waves to his listener. The symbols used in this process are language. Now each listener receives these language symbols as sensory impressions. They must go through his senses, become associated in his mind with other thoughts and feelings, and then be recreated by his brain into a concept. There can be communication only when concept A becomes concept A1. Now, these two can never be exactly alike. But the closer they are, the better the communication. To achieve effective communication, the speaker must first of all have an idea or concept which is definite and clear in his own mind, and his language must represent accurately this concept. We soon found out that words which stand for concrete things and real experiences help a speaker define his own ideas. One day, while Roy Davis was talking, he said, Going to college is a swell life. <laughs> Gee, most people don't know how nice it really is. And when we discussed this, it turned out that Roy had only a vague idea of what he meant when he said, Going to college is a swell life. Roy's concept A wasn't clear. And so each of us thought of different things. Not A1, but B. D. And even things which don't mean that college life is swell at all. He just didn't get his ideas across to us. Then he tried again. What I like about college life is that you find so many new friends there. They're, they're taking the same required courses and they're members of the, the football cheering section and they're all invited to the same freshman parties. This time there was communication because the idea was clearly defined in the mind of the speaker and his language clearly represented it. After that, we practiced choosing specific words that help define an idea. Uh, you just said a group of creatures. Now what expressions can you think of to give a clearer, a better defined image than group of creatures? Yes. School of whales. A litter of kittens. A brood of chicks. A flock of geese. A, a covey of partridges. A bevy of quail. A swarm of bees. A colony of ants. A flight of swallows. A herd of elephants. <laughs> <laughs> we discovered also how a speaker can make his own concept more definite and clear by going down the scale in his choice of expressions from the more abstract to the more specific. Like this. Something to read book, fiction, Mark Twain stories, Huckleberry Finn. Then we learned that the speaker must organize the details he presents into larger ideas or concepts and choose language which describes the whole. This is kind of a pretty place with its woods and some water. Uh, just a moment, Miss Baxter. 
You know, I think you can improve this if you think of your visual impressions specifically. Uh, tell us some of the things you saw exactly as you saw them, in terms of color and form and so on. And then see if you can add them all up to a picture for us. Well, let's see. Everything was blue and green. The lake was a dark blue because of its depth. The pine woods around it were an even darker gray-green. Low hills circled both the lake and the woods. They were so dark they seemed to set off the dark blue water from the bright blue sky. Yes, yes, that's much better, Miss Baxter. Thank you, that's all for now. You can see now, can't you, that uh, when you think of your impressions as far as the concept of color and form are concerned, that you were able to give us some specific details about this picture which you yourself saw. Of course, when we think of impressions and create concepts, we sometimes generalize. That is, we make abstractions. Now, abstractions are useful, and often they're necessary in order for us to get to the larger concepts of thinking. And yet we need to be careful in using abstractions. Do you know why? Uh, yes, Rogers. Well, it seems to me that abstractions like truth, liberty, or justice can mean different things to different people. You need to say what truth you are talking about and what kind of justice or liberty for whom. Yes, that's good. Yes? If you make generalizations carelessly, you can get into the bad habit of using labels that you can't prove. The best people, Wall Street bankers, warmongers, prejudiced southerners, or they're all pinkos, are expressions people use that way. They usually overgeneralize to the point of untruth. Yes, that's quite right. Uh, during the last war, everybody used the word freedom, but nobody was exactly sure of what it meant. But President Roosevelt made it more specific. He said, freedom of worship, freedom of expression, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. And so today we're going to consider another aspect in the communicative process, the choice of language symbols as they relate to the audience. You must consider your audience and ask yourself, are the language symbols which I choose clear to my listeners? Are they within my listener's experience? So well, they... that seems simple to me. You just don't use big words like parliamentarian or fluoroscope when you're talking to children. But then Bernie Stevens got up to speak one day, and this happened. There's this joint in New York where you can dig the craziest sounds. Man, these cats really wail. And the people that go there dig what's happening. You know, not a cube in the lot. I think you'd better translate, Stevens. <laughs> See, I think you're going to have to assume that in any audience there's going to be a certain number of cubes, like us, <laughs> to whom your language just isn't clear. Now, what's this joint? It's sort of a music place, a nightclub. No. Oh. It's a club where they play crazy sounds, real long-haired jazz. All right, we'll grant that jazz is legitimate music. We just want to understand you, that's all. But there's another angle to be considered. Am I right in thinking that cube is jive for musically unsophisticated? Yeah, square. Ah, but you see, this word may offend some of us because it implies that we're ignorant. And such an implication makes communication rather difficult. Oh, I didn't mean it that way. I know you didn't. As a matter of fact, you've been swell about the whole thing. Thanks a lot, Stevens. You see, I persuaded Mr. Stevens to give this demonstration of jive talk to show why a speaker needs to say exactly what he means. Uh, using words according to dictionary definitions that are understood by everybody and using grammatical constructions that people expect to hear. Now, you don't have to be a grammatical purist, but you do need to be understood. And in speaking, you need to be understood in the flash of a second. Yes? Mark Twain once said, the difference between the right word and the almost right word is the difference between lightning and the lightning bug. <laughs> <laughs> Up to this point, we've been talking about language as symbols to communicate your ideas clearly. But besides making your language comprehensible, you have to think about the tastes of your audience and make your language fit the mood of the occasion. But today, we're going to hear some recordings some words which were spoken on different occasions, but with the same purpose, to raise people's confidence. The first of these is a reading to religious worshipers. 
Listen. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. Now the next one is from a crowd to a team. Now this one is from Great Britain's war leader to the British people in a time of crisis. Let us therefore brace ourselves to our duty and so bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its commonwealths last for a thousand years, men will still say, this was their finest hour. And the last one is to a peacetime audience witnessing the first nationally televised presidential inauguration. We stand ready to engage with any and all others in joint effort to remove the causes of mutual fear and distrust among nations so as to make possible drastic reduction of armaments. Finally, we began to think about how to make language symbols interesting and forceful. We picked up some important don'ts. And another aspect of language that we're going to take up today is uh, the cliché, the use of the same trite words over and over again so that we know exactly what's going to come out uh, even before we hear them. And we'll try a little experiment with you. Uh, see if you can uh, finish these sentences before I do. Shall we give aid and comfort to our enemy as if they were our own flesh and blood? blood. To do so, will win us a victory that tastes like gall and wormwood. <laughs> That's right. Uh, better we should mortgage our goods, goods and chattels. chattels. Go at this thing hammer and Tom. Tom. fight to the finish. Do or die. And victory will we'll be ours. That's right. Our next don't was don't try to sound like a book. You just sound foolish. Lillian Jackson demonstrated the notion many students have that good speaking consists of the use of big words, and she asked us to simplify what she said. In my opinion, it is a not unjustifiable assumption that I, I think, think <laughs> individuals who are members of the preschool age group, children under six, are not capable of occupying their time without supervision, can't play by themselves. It is not undesirable to attempt the establishment of a recreational center. It would be good to set up a playground. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you, Lillian. You can see how ridiculous it is to try to make your speech impressive this way. Uh, expressions such as not undesirable just obscure the meaning of what you're trying to say. And you lose audience interest, too. Yes. The writer George Orwell says you can cure yourself of the not unhabit by saying to yourself, a not unblack dog was chasing a not unsmall rabbit across a not ungreen field. <laughs> <laughs> and then we came to the do's, which were harder. We began to study famous writers and speakers to see how we could make our language more interesting. And we found some clues. Very simple language can be forceful because it directs your attention to the facts and lets them speak for themselves. I think Ernest Hemingway is a master at this kind of writing. I'd like to read a sentence from the ending of A Farewell to Arms. I went into the room and stayed with Catherine until she died. She was unconscious all the time, and it did not take her very long to die. I think word pictures are interesting because they give sensory detail. To illustrate this, I brought along an excerpt from a speech by Robert Ingersoll. Like an armed warrior, like a plumed knight, James G. Blaine marched down the halls of the American Congress and threw his shining lance full and fair against the brazen foreheads, the defamers of his country and the maligners of his honor. Visual images are good because they relate something unknown to something known. James P. Warburg, a prominent banker, once said, to ask whether a real full employment bill is a threat to private industry is like asking whether hay is a threat to a donkey. At that, a donkey does not need hay as badly as private industry needs full employment. <laughs> Word pictures stick in the minds of listeners. Here's an example from a speech by the prominent industrialist H.W. Prentice, Jr. He said, 
No people ever went down the road to dictatorship when the price of admission was clearly shown at the entrance gate. <laughs> Some great speakers have demonstrated how to make language more forceful in its rhythm. They often use balanced construction to do this. Listen to Daniel Webster. Liberty and union, now and forever, one and inseparable. And Abraham Lincoln. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right. Some speakers use questions to make their language more forceful. In his first inaugural address, Woodrow Wilson said, men's hearts wait upon us, men's lives hang in the balance. Men's hopes call upon us to say what we will do. Who shall live up to the great trust? Who dares fail to try? We tried to achieve rhythm and imagery in our own speeches too, but of course we all needed practice. A few days later, one of the girls in the class said, Choosing language is like choosing a dress. Before we speak, we should ask ourselves, does the word fit the thought that wears it? Will it suit the occasion? And will the audience notice? You learn how to choose language that is clear, appropriate, and forceful only by doing it, by actually speaking in front of an audience. One day, as I was about to talk to a group of students, faculty members, and their families about our hopes for a new student union, I remembered Professor Morgan's advice. Think about your audience. Be your own listener. Then suddenly, it seemed the strangest thing was happening. There I was on the platform, and there I was in the audience. It was like a dream. I was my own listener, and I soon discovered that my language wasn't getting across. The new student union will be an awfully nice place. Oh, no, not a nice place. A building of modern design, especially planned for student activities. There'll be room for all kinds of things you know. But we don't know. Tell us what things. Be specific. So I tried to think how I could be more specific. Then I noticed something else. When my expressions had been vague, the audience had seemed to be very far away. So I tried hard to make my words interesting and clear. This building will have social rooms inviting us to parties and dancing, lunch rooms and snack bars urging us to eat together, and hi-fi and TV for us to use. The new student union will house all of our activities in an atmosphere of freedom and fun. When I said that, my listeners seemed to be closer. Language had lessened the distance between us. Then I understood. And that's what communication is. Getting ideas across the distance between you and your audience. Your language will do that. You know what you think. If you can be your own listener, and if you always say exactly what you mean.